What's going on guys, Zed here, bringing you a first of many Tekken videos to come. Uh, this is just prior to the start of the Tekken 8 CBT, which I don't have access to as far as I know, so I'm going to do it with Tekken 7, but the content will be on Tekken 8 going forward. The idea of this video is to basically present you with a bunch of Tekken terminology and jargon that if you're new to the series or you're just looking to get into Tekken from other games and you don't maybe know what other people are talking about when you're listening into Tekken conversations or you're listening to, say, tournament commentary or even other future videos of mine, the idea here is I just want to go through terms that I feel are relevant to Tekken from other fighting games or Tekken itself, obviously, and explain to you what those things are, what they mean, and provide an example of each if necessary. Now, I'll preface to you that if it's a game mechanic, like say the rage mechanics or the heat mechanics in Tekken 8, I'm not going to be talking about those in this video because the game itself will do a good enough job at explaining what those are and general things like I would expect you probably know what a combo is, right? Uh, so that said, let's get straight into it. We're going to go alphabetically starting with B and we're going to end at Z. Couldn't find any A term worth your time. So uh, with that said, let's get straight into it. Hope you enjoy. So first up, we have a backswing blow. A backswing blow is an evasive move that moves your character back a great distance and is often highly punishable and rewarding. As an example, this is Claudio's back 3 plus 4. This is an example of a backswing blow. It's very punishable on block, it will wall splat on hit, and it is highly evasive. You'll note that there's no official crouching property in the status bar, but he does lean back there, he ducks his head down, so it's very good at avoiding quick pokes and other highs. Baiting. The intent of getting your opponent to take an action that you will capitalize on. This could be used in ways such as baiting a whiff, baiting a getup attack, baiting a, a rage art, baiting a heat engage. You may hear it used in words like that. The idea is to get your opponent to miss or do an action that you will then capitalize on. Clean hit. In Tekken, there are moves with a clean hit property, and typically those moves are relegated to being either just frames or point blank attacks, and the moves will then gain extra properties or damage. Just as a basic demonstration, Paul on screen, his death fist, this one here, it has a clean hit property. If it hits at further ranges like that, you'll see no clean hit, 36 damage, but if you're up close, you'll see clean hit and 54 damage. This is just one of many examples. Crush, a move that has invulnerability or iframes to another move property for a limited time frame of the move's frames. There are a few subcategories of this, such as high crush, mid crush, and low crush. A high crushing move is a move that completely avoids highs. This is done by crouching. So you'll see there in Tekken 7 the status it says standing, crouching, standing, crouching. So if a move evades highs, it will have crouching for a moment. You'll see here that by using my down 1 plus 2, there is a brief window there where there is crouching frames. Likewise, if you use a down jab, crouching, right, down 4, crouching, down Oops, down three, crouching, right? So any move that actively avoids high attacks by design, it's intended as such, and this is often where you'll see moves just phase through opponents as well. And likewise, low crush, any move that shows you as being airborne, more most typically this is orbitals or hop kicks, which are terms we'll go over in a bit. So there you can see airborne versus standing. This will jump over low attacks, AKA, low crush and while mid crush is rare it is present in the game characters like yoshimitsu xiaoyu and even some moves again such as claudia's down one plus two have a tendency to crush mids albeit not by design other than xiaoyu's art of phoenix stance float a general term of hitting someone out of the air or a floatable state in order to land a combo or follow-up in Tekken, it's not as easy as saying anti-air because there are many stances and characters that have moves that put them in a floatable state. Most notably, you have Xiao Yu, Lars, Lei, Eddie, etc. And anything that involves getting airborne or jumping or anything of that nature. So to show you what I'm talking about by floating, it says Claudio was airborne here and I go jab while he's in the air, right? And I can land a full combo. Frame data. 
There are 60 frames in a second and fighting games are built around this principle. Moves are broken up into different sections based on frame data and those sections include startup frame, impact, active, recovery, and there's also hit frames and block frames. So to kind of go at the beginning there really briefly, startup frames are the amount of frames it takes for a move to become active. For example, using the single jab, you'll see their startup frame 10. What that means is there were nine frames up until the point where the punch was then considered active. Active is the frames at which it is a live hitbox where I will be physically attacking the opponent and dealing damage. So it takes 10 frames of 60 or one sixth of a second in order for this punch to become a physical damaging attack. The impact frame, or I listed as I-10 or 10F, depending on what you're talking about or what you're reading, talks about the frame at which it becomes active. So there are nine frames of startup, and on the 10th frame, we are now impacting, we are active, and the startup has concluded. All you really need to know here is in Tekken, if a move says it's 10 frames, it's 10 frames. And if a move is minus 10 frames, you can punish with a 10 frame move. It's that simple. It's not like Mortal Kombat where if a move is minus 10, you have to punish it with a 9 frame. That's not how it works in Tekken. In Tekken, plus 10 beats minus 10, and so on and so forth. The recovery frame refers to how long it takes for a move to recover when you miss the attack. So for example, if you do a hop kick or any move that has some amount of recovery, this is the amount of time at which you can then take action again. So you'll see Claudia will jump in the air. Let's use a different move. Claudia will jump in the air. And once I land, it takes me a certain amount of frames in order to be able to move again. This is called the recovery of the move. Hit frames refer to how many frames you are on hit, be it positive or negative. So in the case of a single jab, you can see there I am at eight frame advantage on hit. That's the blue number on the left. And on block, you'll see that I am plus one advantage on block. This is how you learn to determine what is punishable, what is safe, what is unsafe, and how you can navigate the game uh, based around, again, that 60 frame window per second. L sweep, general term that refers to a fast, highly punishable, and yet highly advantageous or launching low that is unseeable. And the term Hell Sweep is also derived from the basic mix-up of Kazi or other Mishima characters. And what I'm referring to here is out of their sort of dash animation or dash stance. It's this move right here. This is a Hell Sweep. And this move here is the core tenet of what Kazi is all about. And this is unseeable, it's launch punishable on block, leads to highly advantageous situations or combos, right? And this is essentially what makes a hell sweep so threatening. And you mix it up with mids like that, only to where you finally commit and you hit them. This is the essence of what a hell sweep is. Not every character has it, and they are inputted in different ways, and they also have different rewards. But if you hear hell sweep, they're referring to the fast, unseeable lows that typically are launch punishable and launch. In the case of Kazuya, it's his forward, down, down, forward, or like that. Hitbox. And no, I'm not talking about the controller style. The space on the screen that your attack can actively hit the opponent is typically referred to as a hitbox. And it doesn't always match the character model. So what this means is if I again throw a punch with Claudio, I know that it's more than likely that the end of his fist making contact with the other Claudio will deal damage. But you may notice that it's hard to tell, but you may notice that it is connecting before I'm physically hitting him. This is because of the interaction between both my hitbox and his hurt box, and which we'll talk about in just a moment. So hitboxes, the actual physical game design space at which a move does damage, but it may or may not necessarily correlate with the model itself. Upkick, general term used to describe a fast, low crushing jump kick that launches and is punishable on block more often than not. This is not a hard rule. The hop kick has a few other similarities. A lot of times they are about 15 frames. Claudio's is one of the better ones in the Tekken franchise, but it still has a lot of the same hop kick properties. They are 15 frames. They go airborne. They are launching when you hit the opponent. They are mids. 
They're fast, but they are punishable on block more often than not, if not always. And not to be confused with an orbital, which is a very similar move, which we'll get to later on in the list. Hurt box. The space on your character that you can actively be hit by the opponent, which again does not always match the opponent's or the character model. So like hitbox, which is the hitbox is when you are hitting the opponent, and the hurt box is when you're getting hurt by the opponent. So the hitbox is the damaging space that you're putting out into the ether, and the hurt box is essentially the Claudio model that can take damage at any given time, essentially. More often than not in Tekken, this is done with square and rectangular shapes rather than spherical or circular shapes. That just has to do with game design and functionality. But if you ever hear the phrase hitbox or hurtbox, hurtbox is your outgoing attack, hitbox is your actual character receiving damage. Jailing. A term used to describe a string of moves or a series of moves that forces the opponent to block if, even if they try to unblock. So for example, if I'm looking to uh, release blocks, say right here, right? I'm just doing one, two as Claudio, jab, 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 jab. If the blue colored Claudio tries to unblock after the first punch here, and I commit to the second one, it doesn't matter, he won't get hit. It will automatically block that. Likewise, you can't block the first high and then duck the second high if you block the first one. This is an example of jailing, where, again, a string or a series of moves forces the opponent to block in whatever their current state is, as per the game, even if they decide to unblock. Just frame. A precise or fast input that amplifies a move in some capacity. Not all characters have them, and they are visually confirmed in Tekken with a blue spark animation. This isn't always the case, but more often than not it is. Some moves or some stance transitions people will say, oh it's a just frame transition. What they mean by that is it's a very short amount of frames at which you can execute the certain move, but it's not a literal just frame on the actual move list. So I've chosen Jack here for my example, we'll see if I can get it, but he has this move where he spins his arm and punches, or he has that. Now it might be a little tricky to see, but if you do it quickly and properly, you get that blue, spunk blue spark punch rather than the full swing like this, right? And so this is an example of a Tekken just frame. Very similar to a Soul Calibur just frame if you played that franchise, uh, but there you are. So blue sparks typically means just frames. They do vary in their difficulty and their timing. They're not always about being fast. In the case of Jax, it's not about being fast. It's about being precise. And in the case of someone like Lee, he has multiple just frame sequences. So if that's your thing and larger execution is your thing, there are characters for you in this game. But again, Blue Sparks is often denoting a just frame of some kind. And sticking with Jack for our next one, Keep Out. A defensive act of keeping the opponent away from you by using attacks that have quick recovery and are highly threatening. And it's important to not confuse it with zoning, which is a more offensive intense style of play, which I'll explain briefly at the end of the list when we get to zoning. So just to demonstrate a brief example, Jack of course has long arms, he's a tall robot, he has big arms, and they have an 11 frame poke here, which is very very far reaching, it's very very quick to recover, so even if I throw this out, or his other hand, and I miss, it doesn't matter. The idea is the opponent has to essentially respect what I'm doing, right? Same thing. Good reaching low, right? Good range jab, right? Things of this nature. They all have to do with keep out. A very long range down forward too, right? If you look very carefully at the animation, you'll see that it goes incredibly far, right? And now if Claudio was to put out a hitbox, right, as we talked about, it also extends his hurt box. So if he doesn't attack and misses, and I can launch it from here, let's say, this is how a character who has strong keep out wins the game, essentially. You try to keep them away. Again, there are characters built for this, but any player can just do it. It's more of a playstyle thing. But that's what keep out is. It's a defensive thing where you essentially want the opponent to press into you and, and essentially push their face into your fist which is slightly different than zoning, which we'll get to. Korean Backdash, or KBD for short. Now for this one, it's 
probably appropriate that I turn on my command history. So you'll see it at the bottom there, right? All those back arrows. A Korean backdash is essentially a technique that makes backdashing a little more effective and cover a greater distance and or recover quicker. Now, it's important to note that this is not important really for being a high level Tekken player. There are professionals who'd never really execute this more than maybe one or two instances. I'm not going to do a full breakdown of how it works, but essentially, depending on your character, it is better for creating space than just your typical backdash. Now, essentially what it looks like is if you just try to mash backwards and you backdash, this is the fastest I can do normally, right? Now, if I try to just back up and sidestep, I can do that. And I can even back up a little quicker by doing this, right? And it's called Korean Backdash because it was founded by the Korean Tekken community way back when, I believe it was Tekken Tag 1. And what they discovered was if you essentially crouch canceled your backdash with the down back and tried to dash again, you could dash faster. So the difference visually, again, this is a regular dash, look at the inputs, back arrow, back arrow, back arrow. And I do play on a pad worth mentioning versus this. See how much quicker I was able to do that secondary back dash, right? The precise inputs are back, back, down, back, back, just like that. And if you get good at that, you start going backwards very quickly, right? Everyone's good at it in different capacities, right? Uh, I don't get it consistently on pad, but I would say in practice, if you can get it down to where you can back dash and then cancel into another back dash, just one, two, like that. That's probably all you'll ever need, uh, to be completely frank with you. But that's what Korean backdashing is, or backdash canceling as well. All right. Labbing. A word used to describe going into practice mode and learning things with a character or experimenting with different situations. Hence the phrase, labbing. This just means you jump into practice mode and you practice things. Just when some people are, I met myself included, I use the phrase lab a lot. Oh, I'm going to jump in the lab or, oh, let me lab that. Uh, things like that. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going into practice mode. Lockdown. Similar to jailing in concept, but in practice there are gaps that your opponent can take action in or get hit out of. Lockdown is basically a playstyle that's intended to make the opponent feel like they can't move or attack. And this is primarily done with either mental frame advantage, or which we'll get to, or actual advantage on hit or block situations. Right? So for example, this move puts me at plus four frames on block and it puts the enemy Claudio in a, cl in a crouching state. Essentially, I can limit my opponent's actions heavily after this by doing something that he both can't j swing and hit me out of, he can't move away from, he can't jump away from, he can't dash away from, and I can severely limit my opponent's options. I can make it so he can't even armor out of it, things of that nature. So lockdown is more of a locking down the opponent to where you make them feel like they don't want to move or swing or hit any button. This is a form of pressure. This is a form of offense. Every character can do this in some capacity. It's just going to depend on what moves and what frame data your character has access to. Magic four. Magic four is an old school term used to describe a standing four that launches on counter hit. Uh, worth mentioning that in Tekken 8, the power of single hit magic force has been severely reduced across the whole roster, so you'll probably hear this term referred to less and less. Old school players may still refer to standing four as magic four, just as a general term, but what they mean by that is if you counter hit, it launches, right? And what makes a magic four magical, hence the name, is they're often 11 or 12 frame uh, high attacks that lead to full combo. Some are easier to convert off of than others. Uh, in, the case of, in the case of Claudio, his is quite challenging to convert off of without committing to the whole string. And that's the difference between Tekken 7 and Tekken 8 that I feel is worth mentioning is that in Tekken 8, majority of the roster that we know of so far at the time of this video needs to commit to their full string in order to be able to combo off of it. Whereas in Tekken 7, there are some characters that can just do this and essentially you know, win the game off of just hitting Magic 4 counter hits all day, right? And then comboing after that. But again, Tekken 8, single hit Magic 4 has been reduced, but still a Tekken term you may hear floated around here and there. Mental Stack. 
The act of gaining mental advantage over your opponent, and it's also a huge part of uh, tournament level play and high level play in general, it's quite a complicated topic that'll warrant its own video in the future, but essentially what mental stack is, it's applying different situations and scenarios to your opponent to essentially gain mental advantage. Uh, you may hear this used as mental stack or mental pressure or mental frames or even the phrase momentum. When people say, you know, Zed has the momentum in the round, what they're talking about is not so much that I have the life lead. What they're talking about is that I'm in control of the match, or at least that's how I understand it. So even though I may not have the life lead, the opponent is doing exactly what I want him to do. And I'm applying mental stack or layers, right? Layered pressure or mental frames to get my opponent thinking about so many different things I can do. And the purpose of this is so that it opens up something else in your game plan. For example, if I jab one, two, three times on block, it's possible that on the fourth or fifth time he may feel inclined to duck, right? One, two, three, duck. And on that fourth time, one, two, three, four, I'll go for a mid. That's going to apply mental stack because he, my opponent now goes, oh man, he hit me with a mid after I tried to duck as high. Now I'm just going to sit here and take it. That's the mental stack. Mix up situation where a player is in a guessing situation and has to gauge the risk and reward of taking a certain action, this also includes taking no action or inaction. A, fr a frequent example of this is a 50-50. You'll hear this come up quite a bit in conversation, especially when discussing, again, Hell Sweeps or Kazuya, uh, characters like Jin, Eihachi, uh, Haorang, Xiaoyu, all these characters, they have very volatile mix-ups in different situations and a 50-50 means that there is a 50% risk and a 50% reward and this actually goes both ways. So a 50-50 isn't a true 50-50 unless the opponent has the chance of benefiting equally as much as you do. 50-50s are very much a playstyle thing. Anecdotally, I don't like 50-50 characters. I don't like 50-50 situations. I don't like banking at all on one wrong guess. But that's me. There are plenty of professional players and players in general who love that sort of mind game and that's what they do. Not for me, it might be for you, but again a 50-50 by definition is equal parts risk and reward uh, for the attacker, which therefore implies that it's 50-50 reward for the defender as well. Neutral. Neutral is a situation where neither player has any frame advantage. This is also used to describe the general game state of round start, or if you refresh in the practice mode, this general spacing is what most folks would consider neutral, sort of this range one to three uh, distancing. This, this would be neutral, but by definition, it's when neither player has a frame advantage or disadvantage. Now, when people are talking about playing neutral or Claudio has good neutral, what they really mean by that is Claudio has good spacing. And we'll talk about spacing in just a moment here, but essentially what they're getting at is a certain character that has good neutral, has good ability to maintain neutral. Meaning that if my opponent tries to engage in, in with me and gain you know, advantage in that way and apply some form of pressure, that I have the tools to mitigate that situation. And likewise, I have the tools to start my own pressure. So a character with strong neutral can both go against the flow and fight the opponent's rushdown or pressure, as well as apply good rushdown and pressure in given situations. That's by definition what good neutral means, but a lot of players, what they mean by that is good spacing. So do keep that in mind when, when hearing conversations or engaging in conversations with people. Um, but that is by definition what neutral is. When neither player has an advantage or a disadvantage, it's very complicated and it will warrant its own video, just like frame data, uh, but worth mentioning nonetheless. Okay, Zeme. The situation of one player being on the ground and the other being an advantageous situation. This often happens at the end of a combo or a wall combo, and the phrase okizeme is often shortened to just oki for short. It's derived, I believe, from a Japanese or Korean term, I think Japanese, and again, very complicated, varies wildly from fighting game to fighting game and character to character. Every character has different forms of oki, different, different uh, levels of threat 
on Oki. Some characters have terrible Oki. Some characters have great Oki. And the, the, the basic bare bones decision is, am I going to try to go low and hit you when you're on the ground? Am I going to try to hit you as you're doing a wake up attack? Things of that nature. Uh, so the Oki situation refers to you or your opponents on the ground. The other one is approaching you at the end of a combo, let's say. And, uh, you know, that's just what you got to deal with. That's Oki. Orbital. A general term used to describe a slow, low crushing jump kick that launches and is often, if not always, safe on block. The term orbital is actually derived from Brian's orbital heel, which is this move right here. This is up forward four orbital heel. You'll see there that it's 24 to 26 frames. What that has to do with is the spacing at tipper range is 26 frames to active, close range is 24. And essentially this move is a mid low crushing launcher that is safe on block, as you'll see here, minus five versus the hop kick which is about minus 12 to minus 15, depending on the character. Poking. A word that describes the playstyle of using fast, weaker moves that look to chip away at the life of the opponent or annoy them into taking bigger risks or making mistakes. Poking is a huge, huge part of any fighting game. Tekken is no exception to this rule. But Tekken 7 specifically has had a notorious meta of poking and Tekken 8 will also be very prevalent for its pokes albeit less meta defining than Tekken 7. It's a different conversation though. An example of pokes would be your standing jab, your crouching jab, right, your down four which is more often than not generically a 12 frame low poke for very meager damage and a quick mid if you've got one of those, right? Anything that's quick, maybe fast-ish recovery, relatively safe, but it doesn't always have to be. Um, these are all examples of pokes, right? Standing four, good pokes, right? Uh, down forward one, Claudio's is a little different, but for most characters, down forward one's a great poke, right? In conjunction with your jab or, you know, 13 frame mid, that's pretty standard for a good mid down four, like I mentioned, really, really quick low. That, those are, these are all examples of pokes, okay? And some players use poking more than others. Some characters have better pokes than others. And a character with bad pokes oftentimes has a strong mix-up game or a good throw game. Or for example, in the case of Jack, he has amazing pokes, uh, but doesn't really have much in the way of a traditional 50-50 mix-up. So th that's sort of the trade-off there. Now, there are exceptions to all these rules, of course, but that's generally what poking is. Fast, quick moves that are you know pretty weak, but they entice the opponent to make mistakes that you can then capitalize on with either movement or evasive attacks uh, that have crushing properties. Punish. Punish just means Punishing an opponent for making a mistake, whether that's a whiffed attack or a blocked attack. A block punish is when you attack the opponent after blocking an attack that they are negative enough to where they cannot block. So kind of referencing frame data again, right? If I use my hop kick, you'll see there that I'm minus 13, right? That means that Claudio can use a 13 frame attack and hit me and there is nothing I can do about that. That's a block punish. A whiff punish is when I miss an attack and they can punish me for that mistake during my recovery frames. That's a whiff punish. Range. Often read or written as range 0, range 1, range 2, etc. This is just a way of referencing the distance from the opponent. So Tekken does have this sort of listed on the screen here. You'll see the two slowly changing as our idle animations change. But you'll see that standing right on the opponent is range 0 to 1, right? And this would be range, you know, one to two, one backdash, you know, two to three, two backdashes, and then three onwards. Pretty much range three onwards is irrelevant. So you'll probably only read it as range one, two, or three. Um, not a super relevant thing, but when people are saying, you know, Claudio has good range two, right? He's great at range two. Well, this is kind of the distance they mean, that round start distance. And this is kind of important when labbing round start, which I highly suggest you do. Different video, different time. But each character has different options at the round start that have different threats, right? Do you just backdash off the rip? 
to try to whiff punish? Do you uh, engage right away? Do you throw an option right away? Do you start with a jab in hopes that your opponent comes forward at you? Things of this nature. And this is the conversation where range becomes very important, is that round start. Or push back on block, right? So something like this, I can do a jab into my back one and now I am distance two away from the opponent. Even though I'm minus five, because I'm so far away, my opponent can't reach me with a jab of his own. And knowing this information, I can use that backdash and then punish the whiff jab. Very basic scenario, but this is where ranges become very important to understand. Read, or making a read. This is just another way of saying an educated guess about what your action, your, what action your opponent will take. So when people say, oh, such good reads, really what they mean is, good guess, bro. Rush down. A playstyle or character that is generally very aggressive. Rushdown characters also often have good plus frames, very quick attacks. Uh, they may or may not have a pretty hefty mix-up. Either they'll often have a mix-up or very advantageous low attacks. So in the case here, you can see they're on hit. That's plus six frames on hit for a low that's unseeable and does pretty chunky damage. This is a very good low for a rushdown character uh, if that's what a rushdown character has. Likewise, if they had a quick poking low that was pretty good on frames, like say 12 frame minus two, this is pretty quick. And if they had something out of crouch that they could then utilize in terms of a mix up or an option to threaten, rushdown characters can use this state as well. But again, often they'll have plus frames out plus frames and more and more, or they'll be very, very locked down, very just aggressive, hard to deal with. They often don't have the best spacing tools or keep out attacks. Uh, characters such as Hua Rang, Xiao Yu, right? These are examples of rushdown characters in the very traditional sense. Sabaki. A move that acts as both an offensive and defensive tool, carrying a specific kind of attack from the opponent. Now, as an example, I have Asuka here as she has some of the most sabakis and parries in the game. Now, unlike a parry, which does again parry a certain kind of moves, or in the case of a character like Geese or Jin, uh, they will parry almost everything in the game. A sabaki is an actual attack. So in the case of Asuka, I've selected her, I believe this is two plus four is the input. Yeah, two plus four. And this move is a very, seems very innocuous right it's 23 frames a high it's a kick nothing too dramatic right and uh you know so on and so forth but the neat feature is that it actually has a punch parry so as you'll see here i'm able to essentially absorb the claudio's punch attack and still connect again it functions like a parry but the difference being that if the opponent doesn't commit to a punch, I'm still getting some sort of benefit or action to take place. And again, not every character has these, but if it is a feature that you like, if you're of the opinion that the best offense is a good defense, or likewise that you just kind of want to keep your offense going constantly and you don't really want to block, either if either of those are your train of thought, then a character that has access to a sabaki of some kind is probably the way to go for you. Snake Edge. Common term, yet again, derived from Brian. You'll see that trend here a lot. And it's a move that is more often than not high crushing, homing, launching, but it's incredibly slow and often launch punishable on block. They're some of the most punishable moves in the game. And yet, some characters can get away with it and some players can get away from it, depending on what's going on in the game state. This is the exact move that the word Snake Edge comes from. This move is called Snake Edge. So as you can see here, it is plus 47 on hit, meaning I can do whatever I want and combo off of it. It is high crushing in that it crouches. It is homing. It has those white sparks as we can see there as he sweeps his leg. It's minus 26 on block, which is so punishable you could cook a turkey and still launch me for it. And it's about 30 frames startup. This is, by definition, a snake edge. Spacing. A word that describes the act of navigating and controlling the distance between you and your opponent. Spacing is often used when discussing neutral, just in general. 
Um, however, the difference between spacing and say keep out or zoning is that spacing, in, in my opinion, has everything to do with movement. So spacing is me going, okay, for example, I wanna try to maintain 2.5 distance from my opponent at all times. This is my game plan, this is what I wanna do. So as the Claudio moves towards me or away from me, I'm constantly jockeying for space, trying to sit at this 2.5 range constantly. That's spacing. The idea of spacing is you want to bait the opponent into whiffing, you want to get them to do something that you can capitalize on, or likewise, you want to create an opening for yourself to gap close and get in and work around your opponent's keep out, right? We talked about keep out earlier, how it's wanting your opponent to run into you. Well, offensive spacing is the exact same thing. If you're a character who likes to be in the face of your opponent, like say, Bang, or uh, say, Harang, or Lucky Chloe, right? These characters, they all like to be in your face. And so Lucky Chloe, while she has poor defensive spacing tools, she really, really wants to try to create that opening to just get in, and now she's in your face. So that's what spacing is. It has almost entirely to do with movement, and characters with good movement have oftentimes good spacing. Characters like Elisa, Jack, Claudio, Zafina, Kunimitsu. These are all characters with great spacing tools and or spacing based on their movement. Tech. Tech is just a general term with a few definitions and uses. First one being labbing tech or labbed tech. All this means is that you jumped into the lab, aka the practice mode, and you've discovered new techniques or strategies with your character. So if someone says, hey man, look at this new Claudio tech I found. It means that he spent time in the lab doing research and experimentation and found some new technology or technique uh, to, to use with his character. That's what tech often refers to in the context of discussing a character's strategies. Tech crouch and tech jump, though, are totally different things. That they are moves that don't officially have crouching status or airborne status, yet they will still avoid highs or lows um, just because of how the hurt box interacts with itself. For example, I mentioned it right at the beginning of the video, backswing blow. Backswing blow, a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them don't officially have a crouching moniker, meaning that they don't officially have invulnerability to high attacks. However, a lot of them still avoid high attacks. And this is an example of what we would call a tech crouch or a tech duck. You may hear that phrase used as well. And so it's a move that will avoid highs unintentionally uh, just because of its nature and it doesn't work against all highs, but you can use it in a way where you can set up the situation. And likewise, a tech jump is the same thing, but a move that will jump lows even though it does not have that airborne status effect. The last version of a tech that you may hear is tech the throw or throw tech or or teching grabs or teching throws. That simply is another way of saying grab break. Tracking. A word used to describe how effective a move is at following the opponent's location in both the left and right directions. See, in three-dimensional games, the tracking of non-homing moves, so for example, the tracking of a purely linear kick like this is very important to know both as a player and against your opponent because you need to know what are the threatening options that are not officially homing moves that will catch my stepping direction in either one or both directions. A lot of moves that are non-homing but do have some tracking properties only track to one direction and more often than not you can kind of extrapolate this based on the direction the move is going. For example, this move here, down forward three for Claudio, the kick is coming from the left side of his body towards the right side of his body, and the follow-ups are coming also from the left side of his body or the right side of his body. So it would stand to reason that if I used this, then this, that you should be able to essentially walk towards the background, towards my backside, and avoid these attacks. And while these, again, they're not hard rules by any means, they are very important. And there are moves 
and characters that you really want to be stepping certain directions versus others. I'll give you another example. In the case of Kazi, is mix up. His Hell Sweeper is mid. You can actually step it to his left, albeit it's very challenging, but it's something that you do want to consider doing. Okay, that's essentially what tracking talks about non homing moves and how they follow the opponent, or vertical moves and how their hitbox extends to the left or to the right. That's usually what people mean by tracking. Turtle. Turtle is just a term to describe a playstyle or character that is generally very defensive in nature. They focus a lot on keep out and or zoning, big on spacing, they don't really rush you down with plus frames, they try to just constantly play at this sort of range, this effective space, and any hit they get they'd rather just reset neutral rather than apply pressure. Uh, this is a playstyle that is quite good at higher level play because it's oftentimes seen as very safe, however the problem is that it comes with the drawback of its struggles when you're at a life deficit. These characters, again, struggle with a life deficit, and it can be challenging to make comebacks as a turtle player. Seeable and unseeable. These are interchangeable with the terms reactable and unreactable. People will throw these around constantly. Some people are of the opinion that humans are robots and other people are realistic, and some people don't know how this works. So. Really what they're saying is, when a move is reactable, that means it's slow enough that you can physically block in the correct way to do something about it. If a move is unreactable, it's the exact opposite. So a very obvious example, a punch, 10 frames. This is not reactable by any sense of the imagination. In tech and in other 3D games, more often than not, the fastest moves are 10 frames, save for the odd exception. In 2D games, a lot of times it's three, four, or five frames, depending on the game you're playing. Where's the difference? Well, the difference is that in anime games or, or 2D games, more often than not, you are low blocking everything because that blocks lows and mids, and you're exposing yourself to grabs and overheads. Overhead attacks in 2D games are more often than not reactable, be it an animation, a certain sound cue, a certain uh, you know, visual thing. For example, Guilty Gear Strive, you of course have the dust attack. This is shown with that orange flash, and that is how you know that the overhead is coming, right? 3D games are the opposite. We stand block the majority of things in 3D games, and our fastest moves are 10 frames. And the lows are kind of what we're looking for in terms of reactable attacks, or steppable actions, or duckable highs, okay? Now, in Tekken, more often than not, this is not a hard rule as there are so many things at play here like mental stack, animations, audio cues, etc, etc, etc. If a move is faster than 23 frames, meaning it's anywhere between 10 frames and 23 frames, it's more often than not unreactable. And likewise, if a move is 24 frames or slower, it is typically considered reactable. Now I'll give you an example. So in the case of this forward four from Claudio, this is 22 frames. This is on the verge of, yeah, this is probably reactable in that if you were crouch blocking and I used forward four, you could probably stand up in time and block this. It's very distinct. He does the same audio cue. If you listen to that, right? Same audio cue. So there, that's another factor. However, you mix in something like, say a 20 frame low, even though he has the same audio cue, same animation, everything, that's where it starts to get a little confusing. So I could do sidestep four, 20 frames, unreactable. Sidestep forward four, you might be ready for the low and all of a sudden this move might hit you now, right? This is a very, very basic, basic mix up. So unreactable low, 20 frames versus borderline reactable low. Now this is where 24 frames is where the argument starts to kind of heat up. So this low, by many people's definition, is reactable. And I would be inclined to agree. However, it is worth mentioning that there is native input delay, both online if you're playing PC, or even offline if you're playing on PlayStation console. So do you have to factor that in when you're having this conversation? So if you end up becoming someone who's a diehard going, I swear to you, I can block this 20 frame low 10 out of 10 times. No, you're just making a good read. It's not reactable. 
Um, now if we're getting into that 22 to 26 range, or again on average about 24, sure, then we can have a conversation. But the truth of the matter is, if it's 22 or faster, it's unreactable. And if it's 24 or slower, it's reactable. More often than not, neither of these are hard rules. Wall carry or wall travel just simply refers to how far a combo or move carries an opponent towards the wall. So different characters have different capacities of wall travel in Tekken, and this goes for any fighting game really. But in the case of Tekken, there are very extreme examples. For example, Lars is a character who can basically take you from wall to wall on every single stage in Tekken 7. Tekken 8 has many larger stages, so we'll have to see kind of what happens in that sense. But if you ever hear wall travel or wall carry, it's just someone talking about how far can I carry someone with the ender of my combo or the moves that I use. Things of that nature. Wall pressure. The situation in which one player has the opponent's back to the wall and controls the movement of that player or decisions as they cannot backdash or sidestep properly. So wall pressure is very, very important in 3D games. It's the same as talking about corner pressure in 2D games. The idea is here that the Claudio in blue is unable to backdash from me right now. So I essentially have restricted his movement by an entire axis, right? So either he has to come towards me or try to sidestep left or sidestep right. Now, if I'm slightly off axis, like Sam here, right? Now he can't step into the background or backwards really at all, which means that I only have to worry about him stepping into the foreground or towards me and I can play around that, right? So wall pressure, means a lot of things, but it talks about how essentially one player can restrict the opponent's decision making because their back is to the wall for whatever reason or another. Okay, And different characters have different wall power levels, of course, as is the nature with fighting games, but wall pressure just means one opponent with their back to the wall, whereas the other opponent is keeping control of that game state. Wave dash. Wave dash is when you essentially rapidly input forward, down, down forward, and you get a character's command dash. Doing this is oftentimes faster than regular dashing forward. Not all characters can do this. Most of the time, it's just the Mishima family characters, such as Jin, Heihachi, Kazuya. But there are some examples of other characters who can. For example, Hoarang has a command dash, Josie has a command dash, and then Bob as well. I'll have command dashes. I don't play any of these characters, uh, so I can't really show it to you real time, but it would be this motion, forward, down, down, forward, rapidly in a way that makes it look like you're essentially crouch dashing, which is its other term that's used. So, so something like this, right? It's, it's essentially a Korean backdash in terms of its effectiveness, but it's instead in the forward direction. Uh, and again, that's called either wave dash or wavu wavu, you may hear it called that, or crouch dash as well. That's what that means. Whiff. Whiff simply means you missed an attack. And baiting a whiff and whiff punishing are huge components of fighting games, and it's very important to try not to whiff unintentionally. What I mean by that is sometimes intentionally whiffing is strong, such as jab make my opponent think I'm doing something more punishable than it is, he goes to attack, and I punish his punish attempt. Intended whiffs, pretty good. Unintended whiffs, not so good. And finally, we have zoning. Zoning is one of my favorite playstyles in fighting games. It is a playstyle that involves controlling a certain area of the screen. Now, how does this differ from keep out or spacing? Well, again, spacing is oftentimes to do with movement in general, maintaining a certain distance from the opponent and or trying to gap close safely against your opponent, depending on your character and playstyle. Keep out has to do with moves that you would use to try to, you hope the opponent runs into them and it's a bit more of a defensive focus. You want to turtle back, you want to just use these moves and hope that they they connect and if they don't great if they do great how does zoning differ well zoning is essentially the pressure or offensive version zoning looks to pressure opponents with attacks from a greater effective range than what your opponent can even contest with and win with that greater range difference between keep out and zoning fundamentally keep out 
would be me spamming back one in hopes that it hits you eventually. Could this be considered zoning? Sure, why not? The difference between that and zoning is zoning, I'd be looking to outrange you constantly while still upkeeping pressure. So instead of whiffing back one in hopes that you get hit by it and keeping you away, I'd actually rather keep you at arm's length with something like a down back 4-3, which leaves me at range 2. Jabs will whiff, however, I can still control the game and do whatever I want. I could do this into a back 1, back dash, back 1, back dash. So zoning is a little bit more offensive oriented, but still played far away, whereas keep out is a little more defensive oriented, but you still play far away. Oftentimes, zoner players or characters will do both interchangeably, 100%. I just feel it worth mentioning that, in my opinion, keep out is a little bit more defensive and hoping for the best, whereas zoning is a bit more offensive focused. And yes, you're still hoping for the best, but there's a little bit more of an intent behind it. And you want to actually land the attacks from greater ranges. Like this low poke, for example, massive, massive range, right? 2.1, basically. This would be a great zoning tool, but this is a terrible keep out move, right? This this is probably one of the best examples where this is zoning because I can keep doing my thing, keep doing my thing, keep doing my thing, try to hit him with a low again, keep doing my thing, keep doing my thing, but keep out, I'd rather just use this in hopes that it hits essentially. There you have it. So a bit of a longer one, a lot of terms to go through. Hope that was helpful for you. If you're just getting into Tekken or fighting games in general, Hopefully that makes sense. It'll also lay the foundation for future videos to come as well. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. If you have any phrases or words that I didn't include, again, skipping game mechanics that you feel people should know, plop it in the comments below. Let's educate everybody at the same time. Let me know your thoughts. Follow me with a sub if you like. I'll see you in the next one.